So we're going to focus on the South Pacific and I'm going to cover several different uh, nations and regions throughout this area, but particularly uh, the early history of Japan, Korea, and Vietnam and why they're named such, uh, particularly with Korea and Vietnam named after particular dynasties, but um, just a little background. Uh, Japan is to the east of China. We'll look at a map in just a moment. And it's in the direction of the sunrise. So, in fact, the name Japan comes from the Chinese word Rai Ben, which means origin of the sun, or uh, more commonly known, land of the rising sun. So, from ancient times, Japan borrowed ideas, borrowed institutions, and even much of their culture from the Chinese people. But the real genius was the ability to take these new ideas and make them uniquely their own. So the first question I want to think about as we talk about this is how did Japan's geographic location affect the course of their early history? Because while they share some cultural commonalities with China, uh, they're a very distinct people. And so, for example, it's offensive to a Japanese person to refer to them as Chinese and vice versa. Uh, they consider themselves a separate people. So uh, geography accounts for many of these historic differences between the Chinese and Japanese societies. Japan is an island country. It consists of four main islands, Hokkaido, Honshu, Kyushu, and Shikoku. Now, the total area of land is about 146,000 square miles, roughly the size of the state of Montana. So Japan is blessed with a temperate climate and has a number of natural harbors. The majority of the Japanese people lived along the East Coast, especially in the flat plains surrounding the cities of Tokyo, Osaka, and Kyoto. Farmers have long been able to harvest two crops each year. Like China, much of the country is mountainous. Only about 20% of it is even suitable for civilization. That's not to say it's inhabitable. Uh, it's just about 20% is ideal. The mountains are volcanic. And while the soil is extremely fertile, the region is prone to earthquakes. The fact that Japan is an island country has had a significant impact on its history. The island character probably had the effect of strengthening the Japanese sense of ethnic and cultural distinctiveness. The Japanese have a sense of racial and cultural homogeneity that has enabled them to import ideas from abroad without worrying that those borrowings will destroy the uniqueness of their own culture. So a little about prehistoric Japan. So according to legend, the islands of Japan were formed as a result of the marriage of the god Inzagi and the goddess Inzami. Archaeological evidence suggests the islands have been occupied for at least 100,000 years. The earliest known Neolithic inhabitants, known as the Joman people, lived in the islands excuse me, as early as 8,000 BCE. Now, a new culture called the Yayoye culture would emerge as new people arrived. A new tribal society based on clans called Uji, each ruled by a hereditary chieftain, was set up. Now, few major societies in Asia have been as isolated as Japan. Cut off from the mainland by 120 miles of frequently turbulent ocean, the Japanese had only minimal contact with the outside world during most of their early development. Lack of knowledge of developments taking place elsewhere probably delayed the process of change in Japan. But they also were spared from destructive invasions, unlike early, other early civilizations. In the span of a few decades, the young state adopted many aspects of Chinese society and culture. Nevertheless, Japanese political institutions failed to follow all aspects of the Chinese pattern. Buddhist and Taoist doctrines made a significant contribution to Japanese religious practices. But Shinto beliefs continued to play a major role in shaping the Japanese worldview. Now, the Japanese had been aware of their culturally advanced neighbor, China, for centuries, but paid very little attention. 
the, the Chinese uh, Tang Dynasty around the early 7th century began to meddle in the affairs of the Korean Peninsula. Yamato rulers attempted to deal with the threat by seeking alliances with the Korean states and by centralizing their authority so that they could mount the resistance. Shikoku Tashi, a leading aristocrat in one of the Yamato region clans, launched a series of reforms to create a centralized government under a supreme ruler and with a merit system. His objective was to limit the powers of the hereditary nobility. His successors introduced reforms called the Taki reforms, with Taki meaning great change. The Grand Council Estate was established and presided over a cabinet of eight ministries. As time progressed, the central government proved unable to curb the power of the aristocracy. The leading officials were awarded large tracts of land, and they offered other powerful families were able to keep the taxes they earned from the lands themselves. So the influence of powerful Buddhist monasteries in the city of Nara soon became oppressive. And in 794, the emperor moved the capital to his family's original power base at Hien. The new capital was laid out in a checkerboard pattern. Slowly, Japan was reverting to the decentralized state that had existed before the Tashi. Now, the central government's attempts to impose taxes directly on the rice lands failed, and rural areas came under the control of powerful families whose wealth was based on the ownership of tax-exempted farmland called Shohen. Um, by the way, this is a clip from a movie called The Last Samurai, and it's loosely based on a true story of a number of samurai clans who uh, refused to adopt gunpowder weapons and preferred instead to keep their traditional weapons. Um, so really, I just included it because it was a, a neat illustration of, of how samurai fight. Um, but anyway, so that's just for your enjoyment as we go through this. To avoid paying taxes, peasants would often surrender their lands to a local aristocrat who would then allow the peasants to cultivate the lands in return for rent. And as the central government declined, local aristocrats began to take justice into their own hands and increasingly used military force to protect their interest. A new military class called samurai arose whose purpose was to protect the security and property of their patron. Samurai fought on horseback and carried a sword and bow and arrows. And by the end of the 12th century, rivalries among the families led to almost constant civil war. Miyamoto Yoritoma, a powerful noble warrior, began to centralize the government. He would set up his power base at Kamakura and created a central state, including a bakfu, or tent government, under the leadership of a shogun or general. The shogun attempted to increase the powers of the central government while reducing rival aristocratic clans to a vassal status. This shogunate system, in which the emperor was the authority, while the shogun exercised actual power. And this served as the government until the second half of the 19th century. The Japanese samurai adhered to a strict warrior code called the Shido. Now, in 1266, um, and if you're a fan of that samurai game that just recently came out on PlayStation, Ghost of Tsushima. Tsushima, yeah. So this is a little background to that. Um, so in 1266, the Mongol emperor Kublai Khan demanded tribute from Japan. And when they refused, he invaded with an army of more than 30,000 troops. Now, due to the difficult conditions, he was eventually forced to withdraw. But he tried again in 1281 with an army of almost 150,000 men. The Japanese were able to contain the Mongols for two months until virtually the entire Mongol fleet was destroyed by a massive typhoon. Just so happens they called the typhoon the Kamikaze or the Divine Wind. Um, so that's what the Japanese suicide bombers named themselves after.
Japan, from around the 1200s to the 1600s, was a feudal society. The emperor presided over a splendid court at Heian, but the real power lay in the hands of a supreme military commander called a shogun. To expand his control, the shogun gave large parcels of land to lesser warlords called daimyo in return for their agreement to support the shogun with their armies in times of need. The armies were composed of great warriors called samurai. In return for their unswerving loyalty, the daimyo rewarded the samurai with gifts of land. With the aid of the samurai, the daimyo were able to control Japan for more than 400 years. Samurai were known for their great skill with the sword. Their swords sliced swiftly and precisely, making the samurai a deadly opponent. Their extraordinary military prowess was based on extraordinary achievements and technology. The samurai sword had to be hard enough to hold a sharp edge and flexible enough to absorb blows without breaking. Japanese sword makers were among the first to solve this problem creating a blade that was both sharp and resilient. And they did it more than 800 years ago. Hey. The samurai were known not only for the advanced technology of their swords, but also for their ability to use them. Samurai studied martial arts here at the Karshma Grand Shrine. Like a chess player, a samurai always thought several moves ahead. A samurai learned hundreds of combinations of moves and trained relentlessly until his strokes became second nature and his mind, body, and sword moved as one. Hard, flexible swords weren't the samurai's only technological innovation. While Europeans made armor from metal, samurai used a flexible material woven from leather, iron, bamboo, and silk. These small plates made of tough rawhide were the building blocks of the armor. The armor maker cut holes for stitching and smoothed each plate before joining them together in a flexible panel. These overlapping panels helped cushion a sword's blow, and because they were flexible, they bent with the blade's impact, which made it difficult for the opponent to do any damage. But 300 years after the samurai rose to power, a new invention changed their way of life forever. In the mid-1500s, a samurai warlord bought a new weapon from Portuguese traders. He turned it over to his master swordsmiths. Within 50 years, the Japanese were making more guns than any country in Europe. Soon, warlords were fighting each other with armies of up to 60,000 warriors, including thousands of gunners. To protect their masters against these new weapons, the samurai built large, strong castles throughout Japan. And none shows the brilliance of the samurai's master builders as clearly as Himeji Castle. Its complex system of multiple towers, moats, and walls was designed to confuse and trap invaders. Although many Japanese castles were destroyed in battle, the formidable Himeji was never once attacked, perhaps because no one who saw it could imagine it was possible to take. With the help of the gun, one warlord, Tokugawa Ieyasu, defeated all his rivals in the early 1600s. The Tokugawa shoguns brought an era of peace and stability to Japan. 
the age of samurai warfare was coming to an end. So the question of whether or not Japan was a feudal society has been a topic of debate for quite some time. Political, social, and economic conditions in Japan were similar to those in medieval Europe in a number of respects. However, the term feudalism has been overused, and European historians argue that the term should be more narrowly defined and based on conditions that existed in Europe during a specific time period. Now, commerce was slow to develop in Japan. Each local area had an, an artisan class of weavers, of carpenters, and iron workers. The trade was limited to local villages. And with the rise of the Yamoto, a money economy began to develop. Slowly, larger towns emerged with paper, iron casting, and porcelain industries. Foreign trade began, mainly with Korea and China. Japan exported raw materials and paintings and swords and silk and even books in exchange for copper cash. Some Japanese traders were so aggressive in pressing their interests that Chinese and Korean officials attempted to limit the number of Japanese commercial visits each year. Most Japanese were peasants, like most people in the world at the time, who worked on the land owned by someone else. They were not socially or economically equal. In general, they were free to dispose of their harvests as they saw fit after they paid their taxes. Those who were unable to pay became ginai, or landless laborers who could be bought and sold like slaves with the land they lived on. In fact, a system like this existed in the United States until 1912 called that peonish. Now at the bottom of the social scale was the ita, a class of hereditary slaves who were responsible for what were considered degrading occupations, such as curing leather or burying the dead. Now, evidence about how women were treated in early Japan gets a mixed picture. The Chinese dynasty notes, excuse me, the, the Chinese dynastic history notes that a woman had briefly ruled in Japan in the third century. But it also notes that polygamy was common. Early on, women were guaranteed inheritance rights, and those wives abandoned by their husbands were permitted a divorce. When Buddhism was introduced, women were initially relegated to a more subordinate role, but were eventually allowed to participate fully in Buddhist activities. Women did not possess the same legal or social rights as men, but they did play an active role in various levels of Japanese society. Now, Japanese religious beliefs began with the workshop of nature spirits. Early Japanese worship spirits called kami, who resided in trees, in river streams, and in mountains. These beliefs eventually evolved into a kind of state religion called Shinto, or the sacred way, or the way of the gods. Shinto does not have a complex metaphysical superstructure or even an elaborate moral code. It does require certain ritual acts, usually undertaken at a shrine, and a process of purification. It stresses the beauty of nature and the importance of nature itself in Japanese life. Shrines are usually located in places of exceptional beauty, like the picture here, and are often dedicated to a nearby physical feature. Shinto evolved into a state doctrine that was linked to the belief in the divinity of the emperor and the sacredness of the Japanese nation. And so I wanted to show you uh, an example of Japanese drama, and this is a, a bit of kabuki theater. And so I was just gonna kind of let this play in, in silence. So he's, he's miming uh, as, you know, if I had the sound on, you would hear traditional music in the background, uh, but he's miming the process of uh, ritualistic suicide. So now, Buddhism was also practiced in Japan. Two influential sects were the Pure Land and the Zen. The Pure Land sect taught 
that devotion alone could lead to enlightenment and release. And it was very popular among the common people. Zen taught that there were various ways to achieve enlightenment. Now, Japanese national culture is diverse in the fields of art and architecture, culture, and literature. The Japanese adopted the Chinese pictographic language and adapted it to their language as they originally had no writing system for recording their own spoken language. With time, Japanese poetry became popular as it expresses themes in a simple form. The famous classical Japanese drama known as No, so if you see a question with the word No, <laughs> this question, students always get confused about that. It's actually referring to this um, Japanese work of drama. So again, if you see No as a question, it's on purpose. Um, it also originated during this period, developing from a variety of entertainment forms with plots that were based on stories from Japanese history or legend. The Japanese also pursued their interest in beauty, simplicity, and nature in their art and architecture. During the Heian period, art was expressed in narrative hand scrolls, screens, sliding door panels, fans, and lacquer decorations. During the Kamakura period, the hand scroll with its physical realism and action-packed paintings of the warrior class achieved popularity. Zen Buddhism also influenced Japanese aesthetics, with Zen philosophy finding expression in the Japanese garden tea ceremony, the art of flower arranging, pottery, and ceramics, and miniature plant display. So this is one I always found interesting too, and I, um, in my high school classes, I get to spend a little more time on this, and so I show the kids um, an interview with the Dalai Lama where he explains the tea ceremony. And he said people come to him all the time and say, you know, uh, what's the secret to happiness? You know, people travel the world to talk to the Dalai Lama to ask him that simple question. And he says the most common answer is have some tea. And he's referring to this ancient tea ceremony because the purpose of it uh, is very closely tied with Zen Buddhism, is that a, a simple practice and focusing on enjoyment within that simple practice, that's Zen. That's mindfulness. And so mindfulness is, is often the term we use today uh, to describe that very simple enjoyment of whatever it is we're doing at the moment. Um, so that's, it's the same principle with um, flower arranging or, um, oh my gosh, what's what the small trees? Bonsai. Bonsai, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I used to have one and the name still escaped me. But anyway, um, it, it's all about enjoying the moment within a simple task. And, uh, and so anyway, there's, there's various uh, expressions of this, but, but that's the principle behind it. In fact, the words on this was on the screen and I missed it. Okay, so um, it's just a picture of the Jade Mountain Temple. Uh, the lake's called the Return Soar lake in Hanoi. Uh, so just, I've got a few pictures here just to illustrate how beautiful um, Japan is. I haven't been, I want to go. Uh, it's on the list for sure. So this would be um, Shinto Temple, a worship hall in Nara. Uh, it was originally constructed in the mid 8th century of the Common Era and to Todaiji Worship Hall in Nara uh, is reputed to be the largest wooden structure in the world. And it's the center piece of a vast temple complex. Isn't there one temple that keeps getting rebuilt like every 10 or 15 years? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Look at that. It's like a dedication to a fox spirit. Really? Okay. Yeah, I, I'll have to look into that. I think Japanese culture is fascinating. Um, I've really only studied it at the survey level, but uh, I mean, I, I just think they're a fascinating people. Uh, the more I learn about them. Um, I think you know there was a lot of prejudice coming out of the Second World War, and perhaps just due to the the animosity of the the violence of of, of our interactions with Japan in the Second World War led to some of that. But um, but I think really today there's there's a resurgence of appreciation for Japanese culture. So uh, for what it's worth, now 
This is um, an imposing mounted samurai warrior. This is the Japanese equivalent of the medieval knight in fee-folding Europe. Like his European counterpart, the samurai was supposed to live by a strict moral code and maintain unquestioning loyalty to his liege lord. So the Kamakura era is represented in this action-packed 13th century scene from the scroll of the Heiji period, and this depicts the burning of a retired emperor's palace in the middle of the night. One of the most familiar artifacts found at the, a Japanese Buddhist temple is the stone lantern. In Buddhist teachings, a burning lamp sim symbolizes Siddhartha Gautama himself as he brings light to humanity as a means of banishing ignorance. Now, constructed in the 14th century as a retreat where shoguns could withdraw from their administrative chores, uh, the pavilion derived its name from the gold foil that covered its exterior. This is titled The Guardian Kings, larger than life and intimidating in its presence. This 13th century wooden statue departs from the refined atmosphere of the Heian court and pulsates with the masculine energy of the Kamakura period. So, uh, finally get to the map. <laughs> Here's early Japan, as you see it during the feudal era. Uh, we're about to transition into Korea in just a moment. So, Fat, uh, kind of zooming in just a bit, uh, Osaka, Kyoto, uh, or Hien, and, and then the city of Nara, we talked about all three of these uh, kind of along the, the, the river plain of Yodo. So, transitioning into Korea. Slightly larger than the state of Minnesota, the Korean peninsula was probably first settled by the Altaic speaking fishing and hunting peoples from Manchuria during the Neolithic age. The area is relatively mountainous, and only one-fifth is adaptable to cultivation. There's a continued debate about the first organized kingdom. Many agree that in 109 BCE, the northern part of the peninsula came under direct Chinese influence. The area was ruled by the Han Dynasty, which divided it into provinces and introduced Chinese traditions. From the 4th to 7th centuries, there were three kingdoms in bitter rivalry for influence and control of the territory. All three appear to have accepted a tributary relation with one another of the squabbling states that emerged in China after the fall of the Han. The kingdom of Sila, less exposed than its two rivals to Chinese influence, was at first the weakest of the three. Later, they accepted tributary status and unified the country. Now, early in the 10th century, a new dynasty called the Koryu arose in the north. They adopted Chinese political institutions in an effort to strengthen their power base. The civil service exam was introduced, but it continued to be dominated by aristocratic families. The Koryu dynasty would remain in power for 400 years, and it was an era of high achievement. Now, the Mongols seized the northern part of the country in the 13th century. It was an era of profound suffering for the Korean people, as they were forced to perform conscript labor to build ships in preparation for Kublai Khan's invasion of Japan. The Koryo managed to survive by accepting Mongol authority, and when the power of the Mongols declined, the kingdom declined with it. The weakened Koryu kingdom was overthrown, and a new chosen dynasty was established, once again allowing the Korean people to be in charge of their own destiny. The Chosun Kingdom was actively interested in events taking place elsewhere in the world. They were the first to adopt block printing, and Korean cartographers quickly drew up the regional and world maps based on the Chinese originals. So, here's a few artifacts from the Koryu Dynasty. Now, the Sia dynasty was renowned for the high quality of its gold, jewelry, crowns, and sword sheaths. Uh, we're looking here at a jeweled inlaid royal crown 
of the 5th century of the Common Era, and this is excavated from a royal tomb in eastern Korea. So Japan, or Korea's three kingdoms, um, you can see them here on the map. Now the next question I want us to think about is, what were the main developments in Vietnamese history prior to 1500? So we're going to go through briefly uh, early history of Vietnam. The Vietnamese began to practice irrigated agricultural in the flooded regions of the Red River Delta at an early date. By 200 BCE, a young state had begun to form in the area, but encountered the expanding Chen Empire. The Vietnamese were not easy to subdue, however, and the collapse of the Chen Dynasty temporarily enabled them to preserve their independence until they were absorbed by the Han Empire. Chinese taxes were oppressive, and in 39 of the Common Era, a revolt led by the Truong sisters, these widows of local nobles who had been executed by the Chinese, briefly brought Han rule to an end. The Chinese officials sent to serve the region were exasperated at the uncultured ways of the locals. In time, these officials began to intermarry with the local nobility and formed a Sino-Vietnamese ruling class. For nearly a thousand years, the Vietnamese were exposed to the art, the architecture, literature, philosophy, and written language of China. Despite Chinese efforts to assimilate the Vietnamese, the Vietnamese sense of ethnic and cultural identity proved inextinguishable. And in 939, the Vietnamese took advantage of the Tong collapse to overthrow the Chinese. The new Vietnamese state, which called itself Dat Viet, uh, translated the Great Viet, became a dynamic new force in Southeast Asia. The Vietnamese, however, continued to confront a serious challenge from the north with the Wan and Ming dynasties both trying to reintegrate the Red River Delta into the Chinese Empire. By 1428, the Vietnamese family evicted the Chinese, uh, fi finally evicted the Chinese permanently. Despite their stubborn resistance to Chinese rule, Vietnamese rulers quickly discovered the convenience of the Confucian model in administering a river valley society and sought to imitate Chinese practice in government. The Vietnamese adopted much of the Chinese administrative structure, including the six ministries, the censorate, and the various levels of administration. Another aspect of the Chinese legacy was the spread of Buddhist, Taoist, and Confucian ideas that supplemented traditional Vietnamese belief in nature spirits. Additionally, Vietnamese culture also borrowed from China, including attempts by educated Vietnamese to write Chinese poetry and dynastic histories in the Chinese style, and followed Chinese models in sculpture, in architecture, and porcelain. Vietnamese social institutions and customs were also strongly influenced by those of China. As in China, the introduction of a Confucian system and the adoption of a civil service examination undermined the role of the old landed aristocrats and led eventually to their replacement by the scholar gentry class. The vast majority of the Vietnamese people were peasants, and family life in Vietnam was similar in many respects to that in China. One striking difference, however, is that Vietnamese women possessed more rights, both in practice and in law. More than that, Vietnam had a strong historical tradition associating heroic women with the defense of the homeland. Just a brief chronology here of uh, Korea and Vietnam, and you can find this in your book also. Um, this is what the Kingdom of Da Viet looks like on a map. Uh, Angkor uh, is what is today Cambodia and Laos. Um, but Angkor Wat is the site of this incredible uh, temple structure. So um, I think we get to them in a later chapter. No, we've talked about them already. So here's just a brief summary of things we've covered, um, but I believe that's it for now. So yeah, uh, your book also has a timeline.